Hariyom, everyone. Thank you for joining in today. Um, I know it's 8.30 already there. It's only 5.30 here. And I feel I'm way too early to take the session. But I know it's already getting late for you to go to sleep. So we can get started. We'll start. Oh. Oh Om oh. Om oh. Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvinavati Tamastumavit Vishabahaihi Om Shanti Shanti Shantihi Om Parthaya Pratibodhitam Bhagavata Narayane Naswayam Vyasena Kratitam Purana Munina Madhye Mahabharatam Advaitam Bridavarshinim Bhagavatim Ashta Dashadhyainim Ambatva Manusandathami Bhagavad Gite Bhavatveshinim Namos to Devya Savishala Buddhe Kulla Ravinda Yatapatra Netra Ye natvaya bharata taila purnaha Prajwali tognana maya pradipaha Sarvo panishado gavaha Dogta go palanandanaha Parto vatsa sudhir bhokta Dugtam gitam ritam mahatu Vasude vasutam devam Kamsachanura mardanam, Devaki paramanandam, Krishnam vande jagad gurum. Sarvadharman parityajya, Mame kam sharanam vraja, Aham twa sarva pape bhyaha, Moksha ishami mashuchaha. So we are looking at the fifth chapter. And as always, uh, when we start a chapter, I always like to do a little bit of kind of a reflection as to why we are doing the chapter. What is the relevance for us? So with the same thing, I'm going to put up the slide, which is the relevance for Bhagavad Gita for us is as always, we're looking for happiness. You know, happiness is something which everybody looks at, looks for in this whole world. Um, from an ant to an elephant, and somewhere in between, I guess we humans are also hanging in there, uh, you know, for happiness. <laughs> so with that being said, you know, it is, uh, we are trying to see this particular happiness, what we are looking for, and it really, you know, sometimes the question always comes is, you know, why can't we introduce Bhagavad Gita to our youth? You know, are, is it not really relevant for them? It is absolutely relevant for them also. But right now, their happiness is in different areas, you know, different areas in the sense at uh, more of a level where they are young, they are ambitious. They want to achieve a lot of things. So the happiness is right there. For us who are listening to Bhagavad Gita here, we have kind of moved on. You know, we have moved on from where our youth has been, right? So that is what I'm trying to say here, here is that same happiness and peace which our youngsters are looking for, we are also looking at, but we have progressed from where we are, but we are looking at the same thing. 
So this is where I came across this beautiful uh, set of quotes by Swami Chinmananda recently, just this week, you know, and I thought it was so beautiful because it clearly echoes this and it actually has relevance to our fifth chapter also. And that is, you know, Swami Chinmananda points out about the fact that in and through the variety of actions, um, and it doesn't matter whether it's our youth, whether it is us, we are all, we can be classified into three kinds of people based on the kind of happiness and peace that we're looking for. So we are either, you know, the good people, sattvic, the more rajasic people, which is passionate, which is where I would probably put a lot of our youth in, you know, which is they're very rajasic, very ambitious. They want to do great things in the world for themselves, for their family, and also for the world. We are now at a stage where I think we have done enough for the world. We want to just slow down, right? And then the dull people are people who are also seeking happiness, but they are not, uh, they've not, they have not even thought about what happiness is. All they know is that as soon as they get something, they uh, experience a sense of uh, pleasure, and they equate that to be happiness. So that's the three kind of people that we have here. And so we have these three kinds of people who are looking in three different ways. So for example, you know, um, even though as much as I said, it's the temporary happiness that uh, a tamasic person would be looking at, but for such a person, even if I have a lot of sleep, I mean, this is again on the extreme end, you know, uh, some people with a lot of sleep, maybe even getting into very, very uh, short-term happiness, anything getting from any of this highly addictive uh, things, uh, straight from all the way from maybe like in today's world, we think, you know, uh, tobacco is gone, but tobacco is replaced by cannabis, right? So anything from things like smoking, alcohol, all that, that is one kind of happiness. Another one is the second type of happiness where a bigger house, a bigger car, a faster car, um, position, fame, happiness you get over there. But then, so this thing is you get, you progress from tamasic to rajasic to ultimately to self-control and discipline. You know, so finally we are finding that um, once you come to a certain stage that you have to slow down, you have to be more disciplined. So this is how we have been trying to track our happiness. And ultimately, the idea of coming to, uh, you know, scriptural studies like Bhagavad Gita and everything is where we really understand why we have to do the self-control, why we have to meditate. And when we ask these questions of why, that leads to the best type of happiness. So with that, so the peace and the happiness that we look at is because we are spending our mind and intellect in understanding this happiness. And when we do that, that discipline and contemplation we get is a true prasada. Okay, so I thought I'll put this as something for us to reflect upon as to what is happiness why is it that different people look at it and how this is sort of related to what Bhagavad Gita is trying to tell us? So any thoughts or questions on this? Was that relevant? And uh, what do you think? Hi, Yom. Um, it, is, it is relevant. It is uh, the actually the uh, uh, Venn diagram that you had that made a lot of sense. When the sense organs are like, it's it's this right at this Venn diagram. It's, that's where you are trying to find the middle ground in everything. You are not. We are not going to be sattvic all the time. We are not going to be rajas all the time. We are not going to be tamasic all the time. But when we find the center of it, and and then we find if we can find that center where we are purely, we are in absolute sattvic mind. We are doing something 
something outside of ourselves. It's not some activity that is not for our body, but it is something beyond me and beyond this, this body. Mm -hmm. I, and then, but it is something that is tamasic. It is, it, it's, it's like, you know, finding the right proportion that- Right, the right balance. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So here, I mean, like, um, so when I mentioned the Venn, this is kind of a Venn diagram, but it is not necessarily a Venn diagram. A Venn diagram would be where you would have an all overlap three. of all three of them. But this is uh, just a way of projection, which I found this moment. Chinnananda's quote was so good, which is trying to, you know, it's not that uh, we are not self-controlled, right? So when we are young, uh, we are controlled in some sense because we are controlled in order to achieve the materialistic things. Like, you know, I want to rise up the ladder. I want better car. I want a better house. I want uh, friends with whom I can hang out with. All that is there for which I do some self-control. You know, I trim my body. I look good. I want to fit in, you know. So that the self-control and discipline is more from that angle. But if you look at it, and the sleep and indolence and heedless can also be looked at ignorance. For example, I'm totally ignorant of truly who I am, right? And that is the tamasic. And in that, I get a lot of happiness. So all these three play a part. And we all, even at this uh, stage of our lives, we indulge in a lot of these things. But yet, we through the scriptural study, it helps us to understand where this whole thing can lead to, which is ultimately um, this aspect of recognizing that happiness. And in actually uh, next week's lecture, I want to explain also a little more on this happiness aspect, which is important for us to reflect upon and um, uh, how it is related. So how is this related to chapter five is Arjuna, after hearing the second chapter and uh, then being convinced somewhat in the third chapter, he also recognized that he wants this joy and expansion and everything. But the question was, was he really ready for it? Was he ready for just jumping and doing this meditation? You know, was he really ready for that? And that is exactly why Krishna wants to come here and explain about the fact that many times we are not yet ready for that path of karma sannyas. And that is why the two paths, you know, he is giving us, you know, Krishna never really tells out on his own saying that, hey, Arjuna, guess what? You're ready for this. Don't even ask any questions. Just shut your mouth and just do it. No, he doesn't do that, right? He actually goes through the explanation of it. And that explanation is why we are looking at the fact that at the end of the day, we as humans, we have a lot of this vasanas, which translates into a kind uh, into desires, and those desires then lead manifest in its form of actions. So, in order to uh, help us manage that, we saw last time about how we have the four ashramas. Uh, Brahmacharya, Grahastha, Vanaprastha, and Sanyas Ashram. And the fact that, I think this is a better, yeah, I had it here. So we had this four ashramas. And these four ashramas, it helps us to manage these desires, which each one of these desires give us happiness, no doubt. But the type of happiness we have changes all the way from where we started off our life to the final sannyas. And this is why we shed told that there are literally two ways in which you can approach this happiness of us by taking a fast and a direct route or a scenic route. And what are those two things? The fast and direct route is the karma sannyas route, which uh, Arjuna really wanted to get into. Uh, forgetting that he had actually already started on a journey of becoming a grahastha. You know, he had, uh, he was in this journey. He was brahmacharya to grahastha. Okay. 
And now how can he go into this route, right? So this is the fast and direct route. He has to literally take the scenic route, you know, the scenic route of um, uh, Grahastha where you uh, get, uh, see, you know, the way we lead our samsar, where um, we, uh, you know, we get whatever we need for our happiness in uh, getting a better car or a better house or promotions, all that. Now, one may say, but isn't that bad, you know? Why, why should we really go through when this route is already there for us, right? But the point is, you know, somehow we've come into this. It's like for me, you know, going from Detroit to San Francisco by car, if I have to go, I've already crossed Chicago, okay? I'm driving by car by Chicago. And at that point, I cannot say that I want to really, you know, um, uh, somehow get to San Francisco. I have to cross, I have to go through the paths. And that is why that scenic route is given to us. But uh, let me go to the next one where I want to show you with the thing that I showed last time with this example of me coming from Detroit to uh, Seattle, okay? Because that's where I'm right now. Uh, there are two ways I could probably take this, right? One is by the fast and direct route where I can take a flight from here to here which would only take me about four hours and 11 minutes nonstop. Uh, but I can also do this car ride nonstop for 34 hours, okay? Uh, depending upon where I am. But with uh, breaks, I could take anywhere from one week to infinity. This is what I said. This is how our life is. So this is why I wanted to show this analogy, you know? Uh, today we are in a Grahastha ashram where with this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, I have an opportunity to take this car right either non-stop with just peeping every different place to see what is there. Or I can take breaks at different place, enjoy this. And where it will take me just one week. But sometimes we choose to just stay there for a long time. You know, if I buy one car, I have to buy a second car and a third. You know, just I, I waste my energy in all these small, small things for happiness. And because of that, my journey is endless. So I'm stuck here. I take one birth after another birth to another birth to another birth. And this car ride just never stops. You know? And uh, so we have a choice between these two paths on what we want to take. You know, and we have to be very careful on how I take these two paths. One of them, like, for example, if I decide that, you know, I really, really wanted to see Montana and Idaho and uh, all those places, but I decided that I just want to go fast, you know, so I take the plane, right? There will be, I can never stop uh, thinking about all these places, right? So that is why we have this other path you know, car ride, the car ride path that can stop and do this. So this is how really you have to look at the two paths that in chapter five, that Lord Krishna is telling Arjuna, which path do you really want to take Arjuna? You know, he's telling him that, you know, you have, you're a grahasta, you have actually chosen this, you are a general of an army, you have to fight this, now, are you saying that you just don't want to do that and you want to just run away and take this plane right, you know? So, um, so that's the path of renunciation versus path of action. So path of action is for Arjuna. So any questions or thoughts on this? Does it make sense? Is it a good analogy? Or uh, I, I just thought, you know, uh, need to bring this a little more closer to us. So for us too, we have that opportunity in any of our decisions that we make, you know, sometimes am I just giving up things? Um, like, you know, uh, even a question that I can ask myself is, you know, did I just run away and came to India or whatever? Uh, what am I doing here? Why is it I'm here? Um, uh, do I truly recognize that, you know, um, that I am here for a certain reason or whatever. And so like this, for every choice that we make, 
we have to think. And it's okay to take both the paths. So Krishna is again, you know, that is the best part, right? Krishna, in spite of these two paths, is telling us it's perfectly okay to take your car ride. You know, just be careful because there are a lot of um, sharks and <laughs> crocodiles. And this is the uh, one of the Gita Dhyanam Shlokas, if you remember. Um, which one is that? I'm not even, the thought doesn't come to me right away. But, you know, you remember the picture I had of sharks and crocodiles and everything saying that all these desires that we have are there to pull us down. I have to be careful. And this is, again, uh, so I have to be careful on what is my goal. That goal is very important. The goal is moksha for all of us. And therefore, it's important to look at that. The other thing also I wanted to, uh, one other point I wanted to make sure, uh, mention, I think I forgot your, uh, there was one, uh, but we'll, we'll come to that later. But uh, very important to know what our goal is. If, if I know what the goal is, uh, uh, the second point I wanted to make is suppression versus sublimation. If I take a fast route without recognizing why I'm taking, that's the path of suppression. So I have to be careful on how I do that. If I really understand, um, you know, the path and uh, I'm able to have a good desire management in place by sublimating my desires through understanding, then that is uh, another path. So there are many ways in which these two paths can be looked at. I'm just uh, giving you some things to think about how these things can be looked at, this uh, shloka. Although in the shloka itself, for Arjuna, he says a path of renunciation, which is giving up things uh, through, uh, through understanding. Path of action is participating in the action, but yet uh, coming to uh, an understanding of it. So, Sunita, yeah, go ahead, is Margaret. the uh, path of renunciation is... Um... I should say like it should be for the knowledgeable person. He Correct. is completely has knowledge. Yes. And the path of action is for the, which if we have some desires and we want to go through, um, what do you call it? Desire. Yeah. Vignanam kind of a thing. With the experience, yes. we want to learn something step by step. So, and we don't have that much of um, knowledge to or uh, take the plane ride kind of a thing, you know, okay. renunciation. Okay. Right. So, uh, you know, Lord Krishna basically says that the, uh, the path of action is important for both, you know, even for somebody who is, um, who is in the path of the monkhood, right? So somebody who decides that they don't want to go to Grihastha Ashram and Manaprastha, even for such a person, Karma Yoga is important. Okay, uh, but for a person who's already very knowledgeable, okay, because that's the question that you're asking, for somebody who's extremely knowledgeable, mm -hmm. for such a person, that person uh, automatically will look at the world and say, you know what, I for example, I, I'll just use a gross, a simple example, um, Disney World, you know, um, if I know that um, uh, I have never been to Disney, uh, suppose I've never been to Disney World and somebody says, you know, this is what Disney World is all about. You know, you can go through fast rides, you will see a lot of beautiful things and all that. And a knowledge person, knowledgeable person would look at the Disney World and say, oh, okay, oh, this is what it will do. Uh, but uh, isn't that um, a kind of an illusion, you know, that uh, Disney World is making you feel that um, uh, these are all great things and, you know, all that. So a wise person would look at the world like it's a Disney world or something mm -hmm. because a person already knows that that is not going to give him that happiness, you know. So such a person will automatically move forward faster. That person is moving faster. He's in a fast lane, you know, is in this HOV lane or something. In Seattle and California, you have all those HOV lanes, fast track, you know. Yeah. So they can be on a fast track because they already have that knowledge. Yeah, thanks. You know. So I will skip that. And now we went through all this and 
Um, so I'll just chant the shlokas today. I will not um, uh, up to seventh uh, shloka, up to seven, eight, nine, uh, seventh shloka, and I have a couple of things I want to say before that. Athapanchamo dhyayaha Arjuna uvacha Sanya sankarmanam Krishna Unar yogam cha shamsasi Yachreya etayo rekam Tan me bruhi sunishchitam Shri Bhagavan uvacha Sanya sakarma yogascha Nishreya sakara bubhau Tayos to karma sanyasat Karma yogo vishishyate, Niya sanitya sanyasi, Yo na tveshti na kangshati, Nidvan dvohi mahabaho, Sukham bandhat pramuchyate, Sankhya yoga pritak palaha, Pravadanti na panditaha, Ekam apyasthita samyak, Ubhayor vindate palam, Syat sankhyai prapyate sthanam, Tadyo gairapi pagamyate, Ekam sankhyam cha yogam cha, Yaf pashyati sa pashyati. So, just one point I wanted to make in this particular shloka, which is, um, this term terminology which says yaf pashyati sa pashyati. So essentially, up till here, we have seen, you know, where Sri Krishna is telling Arjuna, addressing Arjuna's question and um, basically um, reassuring him that karma yoga is the best uh, yoga, right? Best yoga for all of us who are in the grahastha path. And of course, also for those people who are. Uh, in the karma sanyas as a way of purification. So then the question comes is, you know, uh, what about those people who may say that, you know, no, no, jnana yoga is a better path. Why should you do karma yoga, right? So for that reason, you have Lord Krishna trying to tell him that no, even the person who is reaching, you know, going higher, uh, such a person has to go through karma yoga. Like, for example, the example I gave last time about how, you know, if I have to reach uh, Seattle here, obviously I have to take the car to go to the airport and then I have to go. So the car is like the karma yoga. Karma yoga is necessary for everyone. So uh, it is just a matter of when I reach or even, for example, if I have, if I have to go to college, uh, if I'm sorry, if I have to go to the university, I have to first go through kindergarten before I can go to middle school and high school. So high school could be like the um, uh, Sankhya Yoga or the yoga of, uh, or the path of knowledge. But then in order to get to path of knowledge, I have to go through kindergarten, which is and middle school, which is a Karma Yoga part of it. Right. So in that sense, they both are same. However, somebody may not necessarily see it. Right. So therefore, he says uh, wise people, they he they know that the, both the paths are the same path. So for that, I just wanted to ask you, when we say he who sees this, he correctly sees, what, what is it that comes to your mind when you see a statement like this? What does it mean to you, you know? He who sees this, he correctly sees. It is not just what we see with the eye, but it is what we see with the inner eye. What is the, uh, with the inner eye, the reality that I'm not the whom I'm seeing someone the other being, how do we see it a uh, uh, cow a dog a, an, a plant or a human being is not different from me we are all the same right to see that truth is what I think is 
that is how i interpreted it right so let me ask you this what uh, tell me what you see on the screen uh <laughs> and what does it mean to you i mean as soon as you see it on the screen what are the thoughts that come to your mind uh beautiful uh, red roses okay anybody else in full bloom the picture yeah. the uh, the way the leaves have been arranged around the bouquet and the flowers that have been picked to make right. bouquet is very beautiful anybody and else and yes a lot of Um, yes. um, yeah. Yeah, Sunita ji, um, I think it means love, real love. love. Okay. Like we have to see love in everybody. The uh, like kind of. Uh, yes. That's uh, I think. Beautiful. Anybody else? It's hard to do parts? that <laughs> in everything and everyone. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you, Jayashree. Thank, Thank you, you. Suvarna. <laughs> anything else that comes to your mind when you see this what is the immediate thought that came to your mind as soon as you saw this maybe that happiness. is a better question to ask happiness so flowers. flowers yeah so happiness yeah. okay a smile a simple smile that that brightens your face it's not uh-huh. just happiness it's that when, when you see something pretty something oi it's like you know you're you're sitting in a very see you know we are in a supposedly a serious right sphere, but when you see something like this it's like from that seriousness you actually understand what the essence is and that you know it's correct it it relaxes you or correct it's something anybody else uh, what what other thought came to your mind as soon as you saw it the very first thing just roses beautiful roses beautiful roses yes the joy in life had it that you know i wish my husband would give this to me on my anniversary <laughs> for my birthday light like touches happiness and everything my husband would uh, send this to me friendship 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 yeah exactly so i i just chose a very nice a very so it's simple a, example yeah go ahead meena is it light hearted and happiness and everything light hearted and happiness and everything okay so uh, again maybe i just chose a very simple beautiful example where it evokes some very positive emotions right but imagine if i had put i will not <laughs> mention any other names or what but imagine if i had put something which evoked some other reaction in you right you would not really see this as a beautiful as a beautiful set of flowers right so i saw this beautiful quote you know which sort of goes with why this quote is ya pashyati sa pashyati you know uh, this is by j krishnamurthy you know a, a great um, um, uh, philosopher we never see because we have opinions about what we see you know we are never able to see something as that object because we first our judgment about it comes into play like for example you know when um, uh, again these are good things you know but still the minute you saw it the word happiness came to your mind but not necessarily the flowers right you didn't see it as a, a bunch of beautiful 12 roses but you actually said it's happiness it is love you know all those emotions were evoked in you nothing wrong with that i'm not the uh, this but the point about it is this is exactly how our mind colors things and superimposes happiness on something right uh like this bunch of roses for somebody would immediately they would think about if it is a young a youth he's probably thinking about his girlfriend and he wants to give this flowers Uh, a botanist for example would look at, look at the same example and say okay you know uh, not every i have to really study the petals and the sepals and the stem and everything so many different things so the reason i put this up is because you know one of the sadhanas which we should probably think about is how can i um try to look at any object which i 
love, for example, without allowing my mind to wander from it? How long can my mind stay in that? Like here, for example, if it's the bunch of roses, I look at it only as a bunch of roses. How long can my mind just be fixated on this? You know? So I want to see how, like from this Bhagavad Gita, we can actually, um, because last week when we did the shloka number seven, I felt that, you know, we went through the ladder, but for each one of the steps of the ladder, how do I, uh, how do I bring that result of what chapter se- that shloka number seven is telling me? So this is probably one uh, thing I wanted to point out as, you know, just to practice this as a kind of a meditation even, or contemplation or concentration, how we look at it. But very important is taking one thing, just focusing. I mean, there's so much of a uh, powerful thing that I can come out with this is not just med- just concentration, but even to help my mind not to multitask. How long can I just take any object? And sometimes you have to look at it as take any object that you'd love without wandering because immediately my mind can wander into okay when I see this like I said you know all this other things can come into so anyway I just wanted to point this thought came to my mind I thought I should share this for the shloka okay so next shloka sanya sastu maha baho dukkama aptumma yogataha yoga yukto munir brahma so here we talked about this what exactly is yoga which is uh, the ability of a mind to rise from wherever we are so again we talked about this is an evolution from whatever values i have of my own where i am how can i expand my um, how can i expand myself how can it lead to an expansion in living? So that's what we said, what yoga means here. And coming to here, which this uh, shloka is saying, is that um, you know Krishna is actually uh, reminding Arjuna that if at all you think that, that karma sannyas is the path for you, let me tell you that it is not an easy path. It's got a lot of um, hardships. I mean, uh, as we said, you know, Um, we can't just suppress our emotions. We have to only gradually rise. You know, a simple example I can think about, uh, and I think I may have given the example last time. I mean, if I want to lose weight, you you can't just do an immediate fasting. You have to do gradual. So too, the case in the mind as well. If I have to expand myself to accept everyone, I have to first understand why I'm doing it. I have to recognize the self in me is the self in everyone. Slowly and slowly, I bring everyone into my fold and I accept it and slowly, you know. So that is how, and that is why yoga yuktaha, yoga yuktaha, an important one, which is um, where I am totally, I understand my role and I'm trying to grow. So this person, the minute he understands, can immediately recognize that aspect of Brahman, uh, that I am Brahman, everybody is Brahman, and uh, therefore uh, love comes very easily. So that's what we said. So then shloka number seven, an important shloka we said, was because it is shows the um, ladder of rice. And the ladder of rice is important because yoga yukta, that word yoga yukta with which shloka number six ends, where he says the yoga yukta was totally established in karma yoga. This karma yoga's aspect is needed because if I decide to go into this uh, uh, sannyasaha path, which many times involves this path of knowledge where I have to sit, meditate, contemplate, my mind may not be ready for it. That is why the sadhana is important. That sadhana that I showed just now, Uh, of focusing on a particular object, getting my mind to totally be absorbed in it for a period of time. And if that is done, then in shloka number seven, you will see that is important because uh, I gave this example last time, because our mind is like this. 
a mind has to be brought to a kind of a very um, uh, a blank level you know where i'm now able to focus on this knowledge but unfortunately my mind is not like that i have so many things going on and i know that on a wednesday night like this you know you're just done with a busy day you've finished your cooking you have finished your eating and now you know the mind is still not totally come to a blank state right but that that level of uh, sort of a blankness is needed and that blankness is what he calls this as a a uh, purified mind as you know vishuddhatma so that vishuddhatma is possible only when i have uh, done uh, my mind is in that aspect of a karma yogi a karma yogi is the one who is yoga yukta where his mind intellect and body all of them are in one level you know the simple example we always say which is when i am faced with a plate of gulab jamun in front right what happens first of all my mind's my uh, mouth starts watering you know subconsciously it just happens my eyes look at the taste everything all this then my mind immediately says i have to have it no matter i would have had a good dinner but i need the gulab jamun you know and my intellect is trying to tell me no this is not right you know but somehow it goes so you see how a mind intellect and a body is not in one line right but through this is just a simple example i used but the karma yogi is a person who is in every action he such a person has uh, attributed all the actions to that ishvara you know who has not attributed who is dedicated who has surrendered every action to that ishvara such a person we talked about last time you know de- starts developing a pure mind so you could look at this also as an expansion of your mind you know it's not just me myself but slowly it's my family my community you know so this way we see i gave this um, how a person who is um you know that achievement of purity of mind is first established you know by karma yoga here the yoga yukta and then finally to vishuddhatma uh, as a mind becomes more and more purified by doing more and more all our actions by dedication to ishvara and accepting whatever comes as a prasad buddhi such a person slowly with that controlled mind is able to conquer the body so even in the simple example of um uh, gulab jamun right a person who has really um established themselves in karma yoga for example such a person will look at the uh, uh, gulab jamun it's not that they won't eat it right they will also have it but they will necessarily understand clearly you know what it's going to do you know so that person has really conquered the sense of taste or whatever uh will enjoy it no doubt about it however will be more controlled in the body in with the senses even so this is just a simple example to show you but actually there's much more depth here in how we are looking at this because such a person has uh, try has uh, you know has conquered has gone beyond the body mind and intellect so for many of us we live at this point of our life uh, uh, we live at this stage which is uh, we allow our senses to go out you know jitain there because it's our senses that is always bringing information to us and then we are uh, uh, since we have no control over our senses we find that many times you know we are not careful on what this um, why we have acquired this body this complex machine which can do so many things we are unable to understand that and when we are unable to understand that clearly we don't have uh, our mind is distracted and we go into a lot of places so uh, i'm just showing the ladder of fall here but a person who is constantly um uh, you know established in karma yoga somebody who is always practicing karma yoga in every action 
such a person has the ability to rise above the body, mind, intellect and recognize ultimately that that person who I thought was Sunita all the time is actually only Sunita with all the equipments is functioning in the world. But in reality, Sunita is uh, somebody else. Sunita is that absolute consciousness. And when Sunita recognizes that she is that absolute consciousness, she will actually see that the whole world is nothing but that absolute consciousness. And when she sees the whole world as absolute consciousness, then who is trying to fight whom? Who is trying to be more competitive? Who is trying to destroy another person? Who is trying to be somebody else's enemy? Nothing, right? Sarva Bhutatma Bhutatma. Such a person sees herself or himself in all beings. So that's the transition that this shloka is trying to show. So on one hand, I see that I am that consciousness and I'm different from the body, mind, intellect. Okay, that is one, one level. But on the other level, I also see when I go through this whole level here, that I actually see that the same body, I mean, uh, many of the shlokas before from Bhagavad Gita will now make sense that I will see that if I am that consciousness, which is different from my body, mind and intellect, then it is just my body, mind and intellect, which is interacting with all the sense objects. You know, so um, I am separate from that, but my body, it's like, uh, I don't know how to explain. Uh, maybe an example would be is if I'm trying to hit a nail on a wall, I'm using a hammer to hit the nail. But I'm not that hammer. Only my hammer is playing with the nail in the world, in the, uh, on the wall. So too, in the world, I have all these objects, the entire world of objects you know, whether it's the cars, the house, and even the uh, people, all that I'm interacting at my intellect, body, and mind. But I, the consciousness, is separate. So that is one level. And not only that, the second kind of a conclusion that one can make out of this is, ultimately, all this is nothing but an appearance. So does that mean that there are two different things happening? No. Ultimately, it is only an appearance. The body, my, everything is an appearance in my own consciousness. Okay, in my consciousness, all this whole world is an appearance. So this is the thing that the Sarva Bhutatma Bhutatma, you can see, you know, that's the power of the shloka. So once when you come to that level, you see oneness in all. And uh, I just want to leave, I can skip this because I've already said this. Uh, you see the oneness in all and uh, you interact with the world by seeing that oneness. So that's the knowledge which is said here. And I said this uh, last time, this joke about how this oneness has to be understood well. If you don't understand, it'll be like this uh, worm in the rum of alcohol here. Um, this professor who uh, told his students that, you know, uh, if I put this um, particular insect, uh, this particular worm in the rum of alcohol and it dies, what, is, what does that signify, right? So the students say, well, you know, that means that, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, basically that I should... Um, uh, you know, that rum, the rum will kill the uh, thing, right? But actually the professor wanted to tell the students that, you know, too much of alcohol will kill you. So it's just, so uh, this knowledge has to be understood properly. So then we said such a person is a Muni who has truly understood this and who's living the life in this world by interacting with the objects in the uh, right manner. So this is the art of right contact, the art of right contact in the world. So I'm contacting the objects and the people in the world in the right manner. I'm looking at everyone 
um, you know, with love, with compassion, because I, they are nothing but an extension of my own self. So that's the, uh, we studied. And then we looked at this knowledge is so very important because it reminds us that I'm ultimately that supreme Sat Chit Ananda. And that Sat Chit Ananda is, uh, you know, basically because of the uh, intervention of the Vasanas takes upon the body-mind-intellect complex and that leads to the ego, which is the PFT, perceiver, feeler, thinker, and interacts the whole world of objects. So this whole aspect is one thing, but it is an appearance on that absolute reality or consciousness. So we saw the whole thing. And now, um, so one who sees his own self, such a person, uh, so when such a person who recognizes he is that absolute Atman, when such a person, you know, does that mean at that point in time, this person, you know, will stop doing everything? No. In fact, uh, a person uh, who has understood this knowledge, such a person will continue to function in the world. In fact, the person may be sitting next to you and that person is probably a realized person, but we may not know it because I don't have the maturity to understand that uh, amount, that first thing, right? But one thing we will know is when I'm in a company of a realized person, I will experience automatically. It's like um, um, by... Uh, there's a beautiful analogy. I, I'm not able to bring, think about that immediately. But when you are in the company of this, automatically you will feel that love. Like, you know, when people say that when they went to see Ramana Maharishi, right? Uh, they will go with so many problems. The minute they sit in the presence of Ramana Maharishi, Bhagavan Ramana Maharishi, automatically the problems got dissolved. You know, they didn't have to do anything. So... Such a person who has understood that knowledge automatically exudes love, automatically acts ethically and morally. You know, they don't, they don't need, like uh, sometimes I think for such a person, they don't need the traffic lights, you know, or if you're standing at pedestrian walking, you know, um, they will automatically stand there. They don't even need, the, they, they understand how important it is uh, to fulfill the dharma you know, to fulfill the right way of living, right? So um, another beautiful quote from Swami Chinman in the here, such a person, you know, uh, does that mean that person will not be angry, okay? So one may look at that, right? Uh, the person may also may exhibit anger, but the anger will be for a good cause, uh, like, for example, I remember, um, and I have, I remember being in so some of the audience of uh, Swami Chinman and the Gurudev, when he gave lectures, he would expect such pin drop silence. And he would expect a discipline of everyone wanting to come in time, five minutes before, 10 minutes before everyone has to sit, have to be, um, you know, um, ready. But, and, but if somebody did come late, he would have no hesitation to tell the person directly saying that, how come you are disturbing this audience? Some people may look at it and say that, you know, how is it that a master like him can say something? But there was a reason because if he did not show that anger, so from time I've tamed my mind, mind's anger, I keep it carefully when I need it, I take it out, use it, and again, keep it back into my pocket. So uh, just a quote to show this. And uh, this, such a person, uh, another beautiful quote I came across, which has nothing to do with Vedanta, but I thought, you know, these are the things that helps us to show us how we are evolving. You know, such a person would speak less and just expect their actions to show uh, who they are. They would be listening more. They would react less. They would observe more, you know. Uh, you cannot learn if you do not listen. You cannot grow. And the less you react, the better you can respond. So these, you know, this is a quote that I just came across in a regular literature. But I see that when such a knowledge 
we get, we automatically start behaving this. Nobody needs to tell us, you know, speak less, listen more. You automatically start uh, exhibiting uh, laws of growth, you know. So that's the beauty of this. Now, then the question comes is, you know, I would love to see such a person. Uh, who is it? Do they act differently or what, you know? So that's why these uh, shloka eight and nine have come, which we chanted last time. And uh, I'll just chant them and we will analyze this. Naiva kinchit karo miti yukto manye tatva vit pashyan shrunvan sprashan jigran ashnan gachan swapan shwasan Pralapan visrajan ghrnan unmishan nimishan napi indriyani indriyartheshu vartanta iti dharayan. <clears throat> so he's showing about how uh, somebody who has understood this knowledge and who lives it, there is in reality nothing different in how they are acting, you know? So for all of us with our five hands, um, not five hands, sorry, for our five sense organs and our five uh, organs of action, we basically do all these things. And that's the same thing that even a person who is a, a, a knower of knowledge, tattva with, Tattva meaning knowledge, with means knower. So tattva mit, tattva mit, tattva with. Such a person also uh, does the same thing, which is seeing, which is pashyan, shrunvan, hearing, sprishan, touching, jigran, smelling through the nose. So, you know, and then ashnan, uh, eating, gachan, going, swapan, sleeping. Breathing, which is shwasan, shwasaha, right? That one. And again, uh, pralapan, speaking with the tongue. So the tongue has two jobs. One is speaking and uh, tasting. Then visrajan, discarding. Grinnan, grasping. Unmission, uh, again, an example from the eyelids. Unmission, opening. And then nimission, closing. And so in all this, a tattva vit, a tattva with who is a knower of this knowledge, who has understood what this knowledge can help, such a person says, guess what? You know what? I'm not doing anything at all. You know? Na eva kinchit aham karomi. So, na eva kinchit aham karomi. Then who is doing what? Well, it is all my senses. You know, my like I said, the hammer, right? Uh, so just like the eyes and everything are like this hammer, only they are interacting with the world. So the senses are working with the sense objects, but I am not doing anything. So that's the uh, thing that he's trying to show here. It's again, beautiful example um, of uh, saying there is no, um, no doership. Kartritva bhava. So there is a kartritva bhava and a bhoktritva bhava. You know, there is no action, there is no reaction. You know, uh, such a person is totally unmoved by anything. That is what he's trying to show. So even though such a person is doing all the actions, but that person is understood at the end of the day, I am not this particular ego. I am that absolute reality. And therefore, I'm not the one who's actually, there is no sense of doership, no sense of enjoyership. And such a person acts in the world the same way. And here, you know, the best example that we can think about it is somebody like Ramana Maharishi, who, you know, really uh, was one of those rare individuals. There are many, many people like him, and we may not necessarily know everybody, but I just put one example here about how Ramana Maharishi is such a person who is a realized master where the person recognized 
at a very young age, you know, what really realization is and spent his life at, uh, you know, um, uh, to reach that highest state of realization. So uh, uh, just another example for here to understand for us is, I have this example of a son, you know, uh, a son, uh, we see because of son, there is so much amount of life. Now here, this is all about the percentage of sunlight, which affects different things. And here you have this example of how sunlight uh, not only, you know, helps the grasses grow, but it helps the houses in a different way. It helps the forest, it helps photosynthesis, uh, it helps the oceans. So the sun, in the presence of sun, all the actions happen, right? It's only the presence of sun. But if you ask the sun, you know, are you doing all this? The sun will say, no, it's only in my presence that all these actions happen. And pretty much the entire world you can see is powered sort of by the sun, but the sun by itself doesn't really do anything. So um, if you can understand this example, that is exactly how a realist master would look at himself or herself. Na eva aham karomi, you know, I don't do anything at all, but in the presence of the sun, in the presence of myself, everything happens. So another uh, quote by Swami Chinmananda, today I actually have a lot of quotes by Swami Chinmananda, which I've brought in here. You know, for example, the train runs, but not the stream, but not the steam. And this is in the case of when we had steam engines. Um, the fan moves, but not the electricity, right? We know that it's because of electricity, the fan moves, but the electricity by itself will never say that I'm moving. The fuel burns, but not the fire. So too, the body, mind, and intellect functions, and they act, but not the self. So that is the uh, thing of what this shloka is trying to show here, which is, aha na eva kinchit karomi. Aham, I don't do anything at all. It's all the actions and everything which is happening is happening only because of the um, senses, the pranas, the mind, the intellect. All these are acting in the world, but I am not that. I am not all this equipment. Okay. So this brings us to shloka number 10, where... Um, which is also, uh, which is the uh, last look and the series to show how, um, you know, he talks about the sadhana for this yoga yukta. Let's chant that. I know it's two minutes, three minutes about six, uh, 9.30 here. Brahman yadhaya karmani Brahman yadhaya karmani Sangam tyaktwa karoti yaha. Sangam tyaktwa karoti yaha. Lipyate nasa papena. Lipyate nasa papena. Padma patra mi vam bhasa. Padma patra mi vam bhasa. Brahman yadhaya karmani. Sangam tyaktwa karoti yaha. Lipyate nasa papena. Padma patra mi vam bhasa. There's a very beautiful analogy which is here. So, a person who's a tattvavitta, who has understood this knowledge, such a person looks at the whole world as nothing but Brahman, right? So such a person, Brahmani Adhaya Karmani, such a person offers his actions to Brahman, to that Ishvara. Okay, that Ishvara was the Saguna Brahman, right? Sangam Tyaktva Karoti Aha. And the person abandons, completely gives up any attachment to any of the actions. 
Okay. Lip, when such a person does the work and who completely is detached, such a person, nothing really affects that person. So, for example, we, uh, we talked about when, um, uh, like, you know, Swami Chimmananda, if he was angry at somebody who somebody came into the audience and disturbed. So, such a person, uh, that anger will never really bother such a person. Whereas for you and I, if we get angry at somebody, right, it will bother us for a long period of time. It will just stay in our mind. And we will say, oh my God, why did I do this? I could have been a little more softer. You know, all these emotions go through our mind because we are attached. We, uh, you know, uh, we are attached to the person to whom we said something. We feel bad that we hurt that person. So there is all these things going on, right? So, but such a person is not affected by that action. Lipyate nasa papena. Papa, which is, um, we have talked about this before. Papa means something which is an agitation in the mind. It is not something which is, uh, we are, um, somebody um, showers a papa on us. It's not as if, you know, somebody from upstairs uh, saw this happening and said, okay, this person deserves this. So I'm going to give this papa to know our own actions leads to mental agitations in our mind and that leads to sin. That's the um, philosophy of sin in our uh, Vedanta philosophy, right? So such a person is absolute. No actions ever affect this person. And the example that is given is Padma. Padma Patra. Patra means leaf. Padma refers to lotus. Padma Patra Eva, like. This lotus leaf, avam basam. So, which is just like the lotus leaf in our amba, amba, amba tuam, right? Water. So, is and just like a lotus leaf is totally unaffected by water. So, that's the beautiful example of a person who lives in the world, does everything, no difference at all, but yet. Nothing affects that person. The person is joyful all the time. Never stressed out, never worried, never anxious. A very beautiful um, shloka which I need to bring to my students to, uh, at CV to show because we are doing some projects here on Bhagavad Gita now. So, so there's a beautiful shloka from Isha Vasi uh, this, which I will, um, uh, Isha Vasi Digam Sarvam. Where, you know, the whole universe for such a person is just a reflection of that Brahman. You know, so God is in everything. Everything is nothing but uh, clothed by that Ishwara. And for such a person is, you know, he only sees Brahman everywhere. So that is such a person. And this example which is given here is this beautiful lotus, uh, which is not touched by anything, the water. It just is still pure and, uh, uh, you know, serene. You can see that uh, just to show that is the Sangam Tyaktva, you know, there's not, nothing bothers such a person. So we will um, talk about, we'll talk about the four kinds of attachment that we typically have in our next week's class. And if you have any questions on any of the concepts today, please do send me a WhatsApp. And um, if it, uh, you know, I'm sure this uh, realized person uh, example probably will um, bring certain thoughts in our mind as to really how can we reach there. So we will discuss that next week. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Santu Niramayaha. Sarve Bhatrani Pashyantu, Ma Kaschit Dukkha Bhagavad, Om Shanti 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 Hi, Om Purna Madaf Purna Midam Purnat Purna Mudachyate, Purnasya Purna Madaya Purna Meva Vashishyate, Om Shanti 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 Hi, 
हरि ओम श्री गुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओम थैंक यू एवरीवन थैंक यू हरि ओम आई वाज अ लिटिल लेट टुडे थैंक यू सुनीता जी हरि ओम थैंक यू सुनीता यू आर वेलकम आई आई विल टेक्स्ट यू सुनीता ओके श्योर थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू 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 यू